Uh, hi there, Marco and Cooper here. I'm at the uh, National Rural Health Conference in Blenheim and today I have uh, Professor Paul Worley with me who is the National Rural Health Commissioner in Australia, uh, former Dean of Medicine at Flinders and a overall rural generalist. Yeah. G'day Mark. Yeah. So thank you for coming along today. It was a fantastic talk you did this morning for yeah. the, the keynote thank address. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering, you know, um, I guess we'll start off with what is uh, the, the Rural Health Commissioner and, and how did you happen upon the position? So the National Party as part of the coalition government at the last election mm -hmm. uh, promised the rural sector that they would appoint a National Rural Health Commissioner to be an independent statutory authority yep. providing advice to the Rural Minister, uh, Rural Minister of Health. and. Uh, that uh, position was then legislated by the parliament with mm -hmm. bipartisan support yep. uh, from the government and the opposition. And the role was to provide advice about rural health in general, but in particular to develop a national rural generalist pathway mm -hmm. for the country, to define what it means to be a rural generalist and then to develop the training pathway that can provide those sort of doctors for rural Australia. Fantastic. And obviously you guys have vast immenses of ruralness, much much more so than New Zealand where we have our rural spaces, which for you guys is you know, just next door to the next town over yeah. really, instead of 15 hours to the, the closest gas station. So we have remote yeah, uh, and both of us have uh, rural and mm. regional. And both of us in many ways are highly urbanised populations. Yeah. Uh, so the political majority live in cities, mm -hmm. but significant proportions of our population and particularly significant proportions of uh, the socioeconomic uh, areas of our population that have worse health outcomes live in rural areas. Exactly. So we both struggle with the same issue of how do we provide those people with access to high quality health care yeah that's sustainable, that's low cost, and that's effective. Yeah, and I think one of the key points there is um, you know, maintaining or obtaining and maintaining rural health practitioners, um, yeah. whether it be general practitioners or rural hospital specialists or a, a scope in between. Um, this morning you mentioned kind of blurring the line between secondary and primary care and having um, physicians and health professionals that are multidisciplinary in that fact. So I guess what what is your, uh, your, your view and goal on, I guess, expanding that and making it more easily available in those rural areas? So the federal government, in asking me to establish a national rural generalist pathway, was basically saying, look, there's evidence about the importance and effectiveness and utility of this, mm -hmm. but we haven't been able to work out how to implement it, how to pull it together, because a program that involves integration of primary care and secondary care in Australia involves different levels of government. Mm, right. Uh, involves different organisational groups, different professional groups, different colleges, different you know, universities across the, the sector. Yep. So that uh, collaborative development uh, was something that needed to be done and an independent person such as my role, the commissioner's role, yeah. was able to work amongst all of those stakeholders, uh, all of those passionate groups of people to bring them together to get on one set of tracks. Mm. This is the way we need to do it. The evidence is clear uh, that the great advances that we can make now in the developed world uh, in our health outcomes are the integration of primary care and secondary care. Yeah. And no more is that true than in rural areas. But in rural areas, we don't have the critical mass to be able to have separate teams of people just working in primary care exactly. and a separate team of people just working in the hospital or secondary care yeah. uh, consulting work. So we if we need to provide both of those services at a high quality, we need to be able to train practitioners who can bridge that divide, exactly. who can integrate yeah. within their own practice primary and secondary care. And in many ways, that's what a rural generalist is. In medicine, uh, we defined it uh, with the two uh, general practice colleges as 
a doctor who provides comprehensive general practice, emergency care, yep. and those elements of specialty care that are required to be provided on site in that community, but there's no person to refer to in that specialty. Exactly. So you need someone who can provide some specialty level obstetrics or uh, anesthetics or palliative care or mental health or aged care yeah. uh, or uh, advanced emergency care. In many ways in New Zealand, you have those doctors as the rural hospital doctors. Mm. Um, but the rural generalist is a rural hospital doctor and a rural GP exactly. brought together. Yeah. Again, the way of creating efficiencies in, in cost, the way of creating bigger teams, uh, and the way of uh, enabling those people to be trained in a way that makes the most of the whole rural health team. The, the fact that we got that work done last year as a country uh, in outlining what the pathway is mm -hmm. uh, means that I've now been asked to work on allied health in rural areas. Yeah. And how do we get access, distribution and quality improvements in the allied health workforce, which in many ways has similar issues. Exactly. Uh, issues around recruitment, issues around too many solo practitioners. Uh, yep. being isolated and not sustainable, yep. uh, needing to have full scope of practice uh, and needing to sometimes work across scopes For in sure. practice, uh, needing good supervision and good mentorship. All those issues that are important in medicine. So it's exciting to be able to actually work with that yep. and importantly to work with the strengths of rural communities. We hear a lot about the deficits, the problems. Yep. You outlined some of those uh, in your introduction, and they're all true. Uh, health outcomes, um, economic uh, decline, population decline, uh, many other uh, areas of, uh, of socio-economic distress, yeah. high suicide rates, etc. But that's not all there is about rural or remote or regional. Yeah. There are also a whole lot of strengths, and particularly when it comes to a place to train, they're a place for students and early graduates to get much closer to patients yeah. uh, so that they feel much more part of the team. Uh, they're a place where they can learn the breadth of what they need to learn around people who they don't just see in the hospital setting, but also see out in the street. Yeah. And therefore, they see meaning in what they're learning uh, because it's not just to pass their exam, it's to help the butcher or to help the teacher exactly. recover yeah. and get back and, and they can see themselves and their families living and working in that sort of environment. Mm -hmm. One that's really stimulating professionally and in many places really enjoyable socially yeah. uh, to live as well. Yeah. I, can, I can attest to that. In, in my fifth year of medical school, I spent it in Danny Burke on the Rural Medical Immersion Program yeah. with the University of Otago. So it was a one year fully integrated in the community, in the small hospital, yeah. in the GP practice. And you know, there's possibilities for that. The thing is, we've just got to get more people into it. So imagine what would have been the impact if you moved that one year to being the whole course. Exactly. So, and imagine if you came from that iwi originally and you didn't have to move away mm. to be able to become a doctor yeah. or to become a nurse or to become a physio. Yeah. But you could choose, choice, you can choose to go to Auckland or to Dunedin uh, to undertake that, but you could also choose to stay home. Exactly. And like you mentioned earlier, we've got everything on our portable devices now. Exactly. I mean... This is where all the library is, yeah. it's there. Yeah. But that's not wisdom, that's not experience. Yeah. What you've learned uh, through your time in there is that there's plenty of wisdom and experience there as well. Exactly. And more than that, if you need some specialist wisdom and some specialist experience, which we all do in our, in our training, then again, you can get that either through a small immersion experience in a tertiary hospital mm -hmm. or through video links, yep. uh, interactions around patients. So you have a patient that, uh, that needs a, a cardiac stent. Um, you can talk to the cardiologist yeah. uh, about that and learn about that around your patient. Yeah. Um, you don't have to spend six weeks on that cardiology ward 
Exactly. Okay? Yeah. And if you spend that time in the rural environment, you will see the whole curriculum walk through the door yeah. of your practice. Uh, we know that uh, the breadth of uh, conditions and uh, distress uh, that uh, rural doctors uh, have to deal with, uh, it's, it's a great learning environment. Yeah. And you get that continuing care for the patients as well. You get the continuing care and you see in your mentors the benefits there are to being able to work in primary care and secondary care. Yeah. Of the patient not having to repeat their story of the discharge letter being something that you write to yourself yeah. Um, yeah. and appears in the one set of notes. Uh, the, the tests are not reordered because you're seeing another doctor in the hospital yep. and they don't believe what the, the doctor in the primary care did. Exactly. Um, the, the drugs are not reordered uh, for the, exactly the same reasons. Yep. So everywhere that there's that integration, you see cost savings. So yes, there are some marginal increased costs of setting up an education network around regional hubs, yep. but they are overwhelmed by the cost savings that you, uh, that you get through the efficiencies of not only that model of practice, but also the fact that you're no longer having to buy locums all the time. Exactly. And that's expensive that's, that's business. a huge expense. Yeah. Thank you very much for you know, giving us an overview of what you talked about this morning. And I'm sure we could sit here and talk for hours, but you're that's a pleasure. busy man. And I've seen you on the phone a lot already talking yeah. to, to radio and to other people. So yeah. I'll leave you to it for now. Thank you very much for, for having a chat. Excellent. Thank you.